video is about how to drastically reduce the number of errors in your code. Welcome to Defensive Programming 101, where I'm going to explain to you how you can write safer, more reliable code that doesn't break. If you often find yourself fixing bugs for hours, you can't afford to miss this. By the end of this video, you're going to know a few simple strategies that can make your programs much more solid and much more resilient to errors. Here's a simple example of defensive programming. So here we have a divide function that checks the divisor is zero before performing the division. And it throws this error if that's the case. This kind of check helps prevent unexpected behavior during runtime, which is a key aspect of defensive programming. This code would have erred anyway, but by adding this check, that gives us the chance to add a much more descriptive error message into here. And that will mean that chasing down this kind of bug is much, much easier. See, defensive programming is all about writing code that anticipates potential problems and handles them gracefully. It's like adding a safety net, basically, to your programming, so that when something does go wrong, and it is a when, not an if, your application doesn't crash abruptly, but instead it responds in a controlled manner. And it gives you a lot more details as to what exactly has caused it to go wrong. One of the fundamental techniques in defensive programming is validation. As we saw in that last example, validating input data ensures that what your code processes is in the expected format and that reduces errors caused by bad data. So consider a user input where you expected an email address. So up here we've got an email regex, and this is just a regex that I think I just asked ChatGPT to write it for me, but this is a regex that we're gonna to use to validate an email. So let's create a function. We're creating an isValidEmail function that takes an email as a string and returns a Boolean. And then we're gonna return email regex.test, so that's gonna run the regex on our email. That's gonna be our isValidEmail validation function. So this is actually an example of defensive programming. By using that regular expression, we ensure that the input follows the structure of a typical email address, and that prevents invalid emails from causing errors elsewhere in your code. Another important defensive programming practice is using assertions and thought out error messages. Assertions can catch logical errors during the development because they act like sanity checks, and that allows you to ensure that the conditions that should hold do actually hold at runtime. When an assertion fails, it indicates a bug right where you're working, so you can address it sooner rather than later. It's all about bringing that error further up the pipeline, basically. So with this calculate average function, that insertion ensures that the array isn't empty before proceeding with that calculation. So that small check, doing small checks like this, that can really prevent errors that might arise from invalid operations like this. Another way you can do it is by creating buffers or limits in the code to mitigate risk. So this can be especially useful in managing resources like memory or network requests. Setting thresholds where your program will warn or alert you before a failure occurs can be a really valuable preventative step. So we're gonna create a function called fetch data, which uh, calls a URL. And in here, we're gonna create a new instance of an abort controller. So that's something that's gonna let us abort something. And then we're gonna set a timeout. So return timeout ID and set a timeout and controller.abort after five seconds. So what this abort controller does, this is kind of javascript -y stuff for us, but essentially we're going to be able to pass this abort controller into the fetch command. So we're going to call fetch, which you can do in Node.js now as well as the browser. We're going to pass in a URL. And then in the signal, we're going to do controller.signal. That's going to return a promise, and our promise will say, finally, clear timeout. So in this example, if the request takes longer than five seconds, it will be aborted. And that prevents resource waste and potential application hangups. And it's another example of defensive programming. Another thing you can do is incorporate logging. That's a really vital part of defensive programming. Consider those times where you've debugged code and you've wished for more insight onto what the application was actually doing before it crashed. Well, logging lets you capture that information systematically. Logs can include timestamps and variable states you can put in there. You can put in the application flow, the call stack and things like that. And what that does is it gives you all the data that you need to resolve and trace those issues. So by doing more logging in your code, you can track the behavior of your program and you can understand what happened that led up to that failure. So by placing strategic logs in your code, you can follow that sequence of operations and you can diagnose problems a lot more easily when they actually occur. So in that snippet, we're handling a try-catch block in a function that processes data. Any errors that occur will be logged with a message, which is crucial for figuring out where things went wrong during that data processing. Again, defensive programming isn't necessarily about stopping bugs, it's about making those bugs easier to find as well. So by taking these simple defensive programming practices on board, you can write code that's more robust and more maintainable. It involves thinking ahead, basically, about possible issues, and then writing checks in your code that allow your software to more, handle, to more gracefully handle those things. 
It involves thinking ahead, essentially, um, and thinking about what possible issues might arise and writing checks in your code that allow your code to handle those issues more gracefully. So I hope you found this video useful. Why not check out one of my other programming fundamental videos on my channel? There's a link on your screen up here. Until next time, my name's James and this is Train to Code on YouTube.